Uh, let me see. So I'm Molly Gordon. Wow. And my guest is Jackie Ford for this Wholeness Hangout. The Wholeness Hangout started over a year ago when I wanted to have conversations about the principles behind the human experience, principles that when we understand them, give us uh, uh, peace and happiness and a sense of connection with each other. And initially I called it actually the happiness hangout and I changed that after about uh, a month, I think it was only a month, in the, because I saw that there's a way in which at least I, and I noticed other people, can attach to the notion of happiness as a kind of destination and judge ourselves if we're not in this blissed out, happy, grateful state that there's something horribly wrong. And what I've come to see and appreciate about this spiritual understanding of the three principles is that it's not about preferring one state over another. It, it happens that as my insights have developed and deepened, I tend to spend more time happy, grateful, contented, connected. But what I appreciate more is that uh, it's all good. Uh, Jackie may share with us a metaphor of, uh, of uh, being on the back of a lorry on a rocking horse. <laughs> And sometimes there are parts of that ride that are really scary, but that doesn't make it a bad ride. So anyway, I changed it from happiness hangout to wholeness hangout um, in the service of a little deeper understanding. Jackie Ford, uh, for those of you who don't happen to know, is a social entrepreneur, businesswoman, wife, mother to three tenacious daughters. She mentors and helps other human beings, professional coaches, entrepreneurs, teenagers, and souls find their authentic selves as she guides them to live happier and more fulfilling lives, while also helping them to develop insightful practices and businesses. Jackie loves to guide women lost in the midst of parenthood, the glass ceiling, and the corporate sticky floor to get clear about living an abundant, joyful life with clarity and purpose. He's an international speaker, trainer, activist, and campaigner for political improvements in Scotland and the UK, for improved health, well-being, and equality, especially for disadvantaged communities. And she founded and runs a nonprofit social enterprise and a for-profit business consultancy, whilst keeping her house and her mind clean and tidy. And I love this end to her bio. Wonder Woman? Absolutely not. Just a woman inspired to live her life from a place of being and meaning. And we will have the opportunity to find out a little more about what the heck that means. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Jackie. <laughs> it's lovely to be here, Molly. Thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, it really is. It, it, it's a joy. It's lovely. Especially to have the chance to chat with you again, because I always love our chats. We have a pretty good time, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I said earlier before you came on that for me, you are the avatar of spunkiness. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> my, my husband just, um, one of my friends had posted something on Facebook, and it was like, um, this is the time to be a wild woman. And it was this article that was written about sort of women being all that they can be. And Jenny wrote underneath it, will someone please tell Jackie she's always been a wild woman? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> time is catching up with us. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. What was it my mother used to say when she realized I had three daughters? Hell mend you. <laughs> <laughs> How old are your so girls? Uh, 22, 20, and 17 and a half. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Oh, Amazing. Absolutely brilliant ages. Yeah, that's great. So, Jackie, when you and I talked a week or so ago about whether or not we wanted to come into this with a theme, you came up with an absolutely brilliant theme. <laughs> yeah. 
I did, I did. And I was watching Star Trek at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I was to speak to Molly about 20 minutes later, and as I was watching Star Trek, it occurred to me, I thought, Molly and I have to talk about living in the unknown, but not just living in the unknown. I think people in the community who are starting to learn about this understanding or have been around for a while often talk about living in the unknown, but they're, they're still, with many people, seems to be a tension associated with that. And it's not about coping in the unknown. It's, it's actually about thriving in this place. And given what's happened to Molly and some of my background as well, it just seems like the perfect, perfect topic to explore, Molly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. Uh, the, not just coping, in the unknown, not just managing with this yeah. maelstrom of chaotic not knowing, but what is it like if that's, you know, the word that just popped into my mind is, what if the unknown is a friendly place? See, to me it is, Molly. <laughs> to me it is, because I think we've been conditioned to live our lives um, always wanting to plan ahead, always wanting to understand what is going to happen and practicing all sorts of scenarios in our head. Well, if this happens, then I can do that. And if that happens, then I can do this. I was very good at it myself for many, many years. You know, I had a plan A, a plan B and a plan C all going through my head all at the one time. There wasn't a scenario that, that I felt I hadn't looked at. Mm -hmm. And since I've come across this understanding, it, that's just all fallen away, Molly. It, I mean, one, it's just fallen away. I think one of the biggest insights I had was, um, was surrender. I woke up one morning and I had this, this literal sort of vision in my head and it was, I had a, a white flag on one side of my brain and a white flag on the other. And all I could hear and see was surrender. And... I didn't know what that meant because I hadn't gone down a spiritual path. You know, it, it really, I didn't know what it meant at all. And it started to become clearer and clearer as my life started to change. And I started to sort of to step back from things, not consciously, but step back and not try to control things in my life control the outputs of scenarios, control the way my business was going to, to work, control the way my children were, were, were being or behaving or, God forbid, the kind of people they were going out with. You know, sort of to be able to stand back and not have a comment or a judgment about that, but not to feel as though I had to zip my mouth. Mm -hmm. that it didn't occur to me that that was something I was to do now. So when we started to, to talk about sort of being in the unknown, for me, it's, it's a place of humility. It's a place of love, but it's a place of incredible curiosity. And I, I, I am in awe of it rather than frightened of it because I know I'm going to keep learning about life doesn't matter what the universe throws at me. I'm going to learn something. And I just see that as a huge gift. Yeah. Because as human beings, we talk about evolving as human beings. And in the West, that means more or less physical evolving as human beings. You know, like things happening to our wisdom teeth and, you know, sort of repeating all that kind of stuff. But when you look at, evolving as a spiritual being because that's in essence who we are we really spoke last week and, and and i mentioned to you in the west we kind of we go on with our lives then one day we think oh i'm interested in spirituality whereas in the east they know they're spiritual beings so they grow up their whole lives nourishing that part of themselves taking care of that part of themselves and not being afraid of the unknown. Because you know that everything's going to be taken care of. Maybe not necessarily the way that we would like it to happen. 
but something will happen. I mean, everyone knows about Molly at the moment and Molly's experience with her health. And I, I had a similar experience in a different area of my body um, a few months ago as well. And the first words that came to me were, oh, this, is, this, is, this is a health scare. That, that is scary. There's something really scary about this. And then in the next breath, the word that came to me was experience. This is an experience. And with my wisdom just guiding me to feel that word experience and for that word to come to mind, I was able just to sit back and relax a bit more and to be able to tune in to myself and, and what was right for me to do in the moment rather than be afraid. And that's why I thought this was just a perfect topic, Molly, because it's understanding that we have a choice and that there is a flow to life. And if we surrender to the flow, realizing that all our experiences won't be amazing experiences, but there will be something that we can learn from it. And surely that's a gift because that helps us understand who we are, who the essence of who we are mm -hmm. is and, and, and how that changes us, how that makes us more spiritual beings, but at the same time, better human beings. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm intrigued by this idea of learning and evolving. And I think there's a, there's a way in which we can hold that with, with spaciousness, openness, curiosity, and the conviction that, that that's, that's what happens. It's like there's mm -hmm. the learning and evolution that is already going on. It's built into us. It's built into the nature of life. And then there's what I put on it. The, the good Catholic A student who hears learning and thinks, oh, crap, I hope I get this right. Mm -hmm. And here's evolution as there's some place to get instead yeah. of a celebration of there is something that's already happening. And that's an edge that I, I keep playing you know there's sometimes when i just feel profoundly supported and there's no way I, I remember saying this to a friend once i said you can't f this up <laughs> you know and in that moment i just really saw that you just you do what you do and it all unfolds and it either goes the way you expect or it goes some other way and then something else happens. And we can participate in that from a place of curiosity mm -hmm. and, and all the other emotions that may be going on or we can judge the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And I notice that whenever I judge it, either judge what's happening in the unknown or judge myself for the way I'm experiencing it, then everything goes downhill. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I, I think that the learning and evolution are so rich. It's important for us to recognize that. I feel like we get to collaborate with some miraculous, marvelous process that's bigger than we are. And at the same time, the less I think about that, or the less I put on that, the better. Am I making sense? And yeah, absolutely, Molly. And, and my my experiences, the more serious I get about what I'm putting on it, the more I muck it up. Right. The more I get in my own way. Right you know, the more I don't have clarity about what I'm meant to be doing or how I'm meant to be doing it, the extra thinking that I get. Yeah. So to be able to, to see it with, with, with humour and to be able to see it with clarity. Mm -hmm. And for me, a tiny pinch of mischief mm -hmm. means that, 
you know, I'm seeing clearly. There's, you know, I've got nothing on it and that's absolutely fine. But you're absolutely right. When you, when you do start to get in your own way, then it can cause all sorts of issues for you. Right. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was experiencing a lot of pain and nausea after my surgery. And the hardest part of that, which now actually cracks me up a little bit, but I was lying in bed feeling horrible and also stoned on painkillers that were making me very sick. And I was judging the crap out of myself. If you were thinking about somebody besides yourself, you wouldn't be so miserable, <laughs> which I think is true. <laughs> Yeah. But it was also irrelevant. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the other day I was remembering that experience and I thought, geez, there I am in a really low state of mind, you know, really preoccupied, thinking a lot, hurting a lot, trying to think my way into a higher state of mind, which just doesn't work. So I'm wondering... And let me just see what I can do with this. Um, um, I'm wondering, what can you say, Jackie, about how we can embrace or stay with the unknown? Because I was missing something during that time. Oh... For me, it's the difference between a waltz and a tango. Mm -hmm. When you watch a couple dance on a dance floor and they're doing a waltz, it's seamless. It's beautiful and it's elegant and there's a wonderful flow. When I am in that state of being in the moment, in my life, living in the unknown, just enjoying what's happening or not enjoying what's happening, but not judging it. Mm -hmm. That's what life feels like. Mm. So there's a lovely smoothness and an elegance to how life unfolds. When I'm not in that place, life can feel like a tangle tense, agitated. It's a very, very different feel to it, Molly. Mm -hmm. And that's when I know that I've got in, I've got into my thinking. But what I love about how when our understanding deepens with the three principles or with this understanding of life, the minute that you start to get that feeling, you start to know that you're lost in thought. You start to understand that you're not coming from that, that place of a flow, that place of, as I call it, my, my waltz, you know, mm -hmm. my waltz, you know, and everything's not unfolding the way I want it to. And often when I, I feel life is like the tangle, my life starts to unravel. <laughs> you, know? Right. So, <laughs> you know, one thing happens, then another thing happens. And it always asks me to question, where is my state of mind? Where is my state of mind? Because I always find when I'm in that place that things feel as though they're unraveling, I'm in a low state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and that could be I'm tired. It could be I've eaten something I shouldn't have eaten. It could be that I'm trying to do too much and I'm not being gentle with myself. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do too much. I'm trying to do everything for everybody else and not being cognizant of loving and looking after myself. So when I start to feel myself moving out of a place of flow and, and being in the moment, I naturally start to go, okay, what is it I'm not seeing? I don't question what's going on, what's happening, why am I thinking this way, and try to change what I'm thinking. It's for me, what am I not seeing? Mm. And I have to let it go and just go on with my day. Mm -hmm. Because I think I've, I've analysed my life for too long, Molly. Right. <laughs> you know? Oh, geez. 
you know, ever since I was a young woman, um, I knew that I thought too much. I've always known that I thought too much. Um, I think I even have a book that's called Women Who Think Too Much. And as a young woman with three children, if we were ever in a bookstore and my husband couldn't find me and he asked the kids, where's mum? They'd say, well, she's in the self-help section. Now that's kids that are six, four and two who know their mum's in the self-help section looking for for a book, um, which they still they still rib me about. You know, yes. going to the self-help section, mum. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I probably could build a house, actually, with the number of self-help books I've had in the past. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it's that whole state of flow, Molly, is, is, is understanding, where am I? What am I not seeing? And then just getting on with my day, rather than, oh, I'm feeling this, so it must be this. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then you look for validation, don't you? Right. Oh, this is why I feel terrible. This is what's going on. Here are the people that are responsible for how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And never that. Yeah. I love the gentleness and precision of what am I not seeing? And then kind of letting go of the question. Yeah. Because then life in, will teach us. We'll always see what we're not seeing. We don't have to figure it out. Um, I just think, Molly, my experience when I ask that question, it's almost like, it's like I'm letting go of something and then that letting go, I'll get the answer. I might not get it straight away. You know, it might come to me later on, but it it just creates a space for the answer to come in for me to hear what it is I need to hear. Yeah, I love that. That's, That's so radically different than than even introspection, mm. you know, like you, I, I worked, I'm black belt in working on myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear every time I get caught up in my thinking, um, there's actually two things I've noticed that are, that are usually what's catching me up. And one of them is somehow or other I've slipped into thinking I need to work on myself some more. Mm. and that's really exhausting it's really exhausting and I can't remember what the other one is so it doesn't matter (laughs) but what strikes me is that the way you ask that question what am I not seeing introspection is looking in here and accessing my personal mind with the best intent but still Mm -hmm. it's a very limited place to look and what am I not seeing? And then going on with you know, writing a newsletter or scrubbing the kitchen floor or putting out a proposal or whatever is accessing the unknown. Yes. Yes. I don't have all the answers, Molly. Nobody has all the answers. You know, if we did have all the answers, we'd all be terribly clever. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and this is probably the right time to tell that story that, that I was having a conversation with one of my mentors and um, I, I, I am a self-confessed control freak and have been in, in the past. Um, so much so that, that one, one day my husband came into the kitchen and I was in the kitchen with my, at the time, my 17-year-old daughter was only 13 and um, we were cooking a cake together in, in the kitchen. And Jerry came in and he said, oh, this is how two control freaks make a cake. <laughs> because <laughs> we were fighting over the recipe book. We were fighting over who was getting to, you know, to stir or who was getting to taste. And it, it was, I, I had never seen it. I just thought I had good ideas. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is how it is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, it was fascinating to hear, hear my mentor turn around to me and say, you know, Jackie, you, you're not on a racing horse getting to the finish line. You're actually on a rocking horse on the back of a truck or a lorry. And that just hit me between the eyes because the metaphor was so clean that I could see that. 
the hugeness of that in terms of me as this atomic being in the universe rather than me as a, um, an egoic human being trying to control my life. And again, it's just been a gradual, gradual slipping back of just sort of, you know, letting the reins looser and looser. You know, even with my kids, I had, I had um, a, a vision one night about them as well. And it's like every mother will know, you know, sort of, there's a saying about your children being tied to your apron strings. You know, that there's a strong mother and, you know, matriarch and she's looking after her family and controlling things. And all I saw was the apron strings untying themselves. I, wow. you know, and, and it, was, it was lovely for me to see that because at that point I realized that my kids, my daughters are my daughters, but they're human beings. But not only the human beings, they're, they're, they're souls like me. And in that instant, it was seeing them as equals. And that has been one of the most beautiful things for me as a parent, to see them as the wonderful souls that they are with all their strengths and, and love and energy that they have within them and how they negotiate the unknown. Every single day, the same way that I do, getting tripped up, falling down picking ourselves back up again, but always learning. Yeah, parenting has to be one of the ultimate experiences of living in the unknown. Mm. Absolutely. And a close second is owning your own business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what does... What does, what does living in the unknown actually mean to you? It means freedom to me, Molly. It freedom. means freedom. Freedom to be who I need to be in any given moment in time. I know that I will be that person. My... Oh, the experiences that I've had since coming across this understanding that have validated that for me are just huge, absolutely huge. I have found myself saying things um, about the direction of my business. I took my websites off of the internet because I knew they weren't right. I knew that I had to change them, but I never felt in a rush to get them back up there again. And I'm just in a place now, six, seven months later, I'm about to put them back up again because I have let the nature of what they are unfold rather than strategically force what I think they should be. So living in the unknown for me has allowed me to drop, and, and I'm, I'm saying drop, it's not an active word, it has dropped away for me. The need for approval, um, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Um, I have conversations with politicians. I work with disadvantaged communities. I will speak to anybody about anything to do with life, this understanding, um, my pricing structures, the value that I feel I bring to a discussion with absolute certainty, Molly, um, and a very, very deep respect for myself and for other people. Um, because that's where I am now, I'm finding that my business is taking care of itself. I'm, I'm working with people I want to work with rather than people who I feel I should work with. So I'm turning away work that doesn't feel right. Okay. I'm working with people where I feel a connection so it's, it's soul nurturing work that I'm doing rather than I need to put food on the table because what's become very, very apparent to me is money flows whenever I need, I have, it happens. 
And that's just been proven time and time and time again to me. So I'm not afraid of it. So this whole thing about having your own business, at the, the beginning, there's always this like feast or famine. <laughs> there's money coming in or there isn't money coming in. I now know that none of that is tied up to my well-being. None of it. I, I can tie it up to my well-being if I want to. I can create all those thoughts and all those crazy states of mind around that. You know, maybe, maybe sometimes I'll dip in there. But then I'll make it so ridiculous that I can't stop laughing. Right. Because I can see it. So having my own business for me is freedom. Living and working from that place, I'm always guided to do what I'm meant to do, Molly. Me, I said about a year and a half ago that, that oh yeah, I want to do something to bring this understanding to the, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. Because I could look at all of the, the policies and the health policies and I could see that everybody's looking at after behaviour, nobody's looking at before behaviour. And so my discussion started, but there were people that I knew that I wasn't to go and see yet. Now, don't ask me why I wasn't to go and see them yet, Molly, but I knew, I knew without any uncertainty that's what I was to do. Mm -hmm. There were people I was to approach and have conversations with, and I just followed that, that wisdom. I just followed what I was being guided to do, to ask people, elders from the Three Principles community to come and help me and work with me, with nothing on it, absolutely Ooh. nothing on it. So I guess when I'm saying there's a freedom, there's a freedom from everything I thought running a business should be, to just showing up in the moment and being who it is I am meant to be in that moment, and knowing that I can't go wrong, Molly. Mm -hmm. I can't go wrong. So if I'm meant to talk about deep spirituality with a politician, that's where I'll go. If I'm meant to challenge someone, that's what I'll do. It's whatever feels right in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What I'm just thinking of all the hundreds and even thousands of small business owners I've worked with over the years and how they get tangled up about money and marketing and selling and getting clients and how much of that tangle is based in the fantasy that there's a way to do it and that they're not the kind of people who can do it that way. So it's like there's two storylines going that mm -hmm. are opposed. And what I hear you saying is that neither of those storylines is true or necessary. Absolutely, Molly. I think that's that's something that I fell into very, very quickly. I stopped looking outside of myself for the answer. Um, there's no blueprint. Mm -hmm. You can make up a blueprint. Right. And when you make up that blueprint, you can have all sorts of thinking about that blueprint, about how you're meant to implement it, how you're meant to implement it, what is the cost of implementing it. But what I found is that because I, I just, there is no blueprint and, and, and I don't need to look outside of myself for anything else. That, that allows me to do what it is I'm meant to do. Now, I'm not saying I do everything in my business. Mm -hmm. I have an accountant, I have a PA, I have someone who sorts out my web stuff for me. But that, that's part of living in the unknown too. It's realizing that for me, in my experience, that's not a part of my business that I want to do. I love the human contact. That's the bit that thrills me. Yeah. That's the bit that I love. That's the bit that brings the business to me. That's where the connection is. 
And and I did, as as you rightly said, there was there was a time I did get myself caught up in the whole thing about about business and this is the right way to do it and, and I need to have this and I have to have a Twitter account and I need to produce all these various ways of doing things. I was just starting to make myself feel physically sick, Molly. Mm-hmm believing that this was the way things were meant to be rather than this is how they are. Right, right. When I started my coaching practice in 1996, I read everything I could find about coaching and uh, I already knew a fair amount about business and planning. And I would sit down and I would try to write a marketing plan or I'd try to do a spreadsheet and figure out pricing. And I don't remember whether it took me three weeks or three months of that. But at some point, I realized that for whatever reason, every time I tried to do that, I either got sick or I got depressed. So it seemed obvious to me that it wasn't working. So I stopped. And over the time that was, you know, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, there have been times when making a plan and doing a spreadsheet has been the obvious thing to do and it's even been fun. But I've always remembered that experience. It was so clear that it wasn't helping. And I guess I would just love for people hearing this to have some respect for those inklings you get about whatever you're doing, whether it's regarding housework or your business or your relationships or how you're trying to change the world for the better, that if you feel like you're making yourself sick (laughs) or you're beating your head against a wall, that it's not working and that it's a real option to drop it and find out what else shows up out of this unknown that you're pointing to, Jackie. Hmm. I mean, I had a corporate career for about 27 years where I was expected to, you know, whenever we were, we were starting any kind of campaign, I had my stakeholder lists and my call objectives, my next call objectives, and, you know, you name it, my strategic plan and, you know, my five-year plan. And, and and it was amazing, Molly. I think when I started my own businesses, I was so sick of trying to plan that I, I just went into my businesses with no plan. Mm-hmm. And then I beat myself up because I didn't have a plan. <laughs> it's like, why are things working and I don't have a plan? Because people would say, what's your plan? And like, I don't have a plan. And then I'd feel guilty. Right. But within the first year of, you know, one, one of my businesses, it was, it was creating a six-figure sum of money because I was showing up not not scared or frightened, but just in the moment wanting to be of service, wanting to use what what I knew I had in me to help the other person or to share with the other person. And I loved what you said about coaching and coaching clients. And I always say this in the webinars and the conversations that I have. The minute that we as human beings get into distinctions about I am this and you are that. I am a coach and I am going to help you. We start getting into all sorts of thinking. Mm -hmm. The other day, Jerry and I were walking along the road and there was a young woman in front of us. um, And she she was probably about 20 years of age, very quirky young woman, beautifully dressed, very unusual. And as she was walking along the road, all of a sudden she started to twitch and it was almost like her legs were giving way underneath her. And Jerry asked her if she needed a hand because she was carrying shopping. And she said, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. So we started to walk home, but not very quickly, just in case we were needed. And I found myself turning around to Jerry. And then the next thing I heard the girl, she swore. She obviously had Tourette's. And she didn't want to swear when we were behind her. So this was coming out in her body some other way to try to control what was going on. And when I heard her swear, I I turned into Jerry and I said, that girl's got Tourette's. I'd really like to help her. And then I stopped myself, Molly. And I said, I've said the wrong word. 
I'd love to share with that girl what I know. And to me, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. As human beings, that we don't think of ourselves as different or better than each other, that I'm a coach and you need fixed or... You know, I'm a doctor and you're a patient. We are all human beings. We are all souls. And if we see each other as that, it's not that we want to help one another, but we want to share who we are and what we know. Right. Because just in that sharing will have an impact. Right. Right. Every practitioner that I've seen and, and teacher in, whether it's in the three principles world or, or any other world of insight, who has a real impact, is coming from their humanness, not their superiority. Yeah. 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 And it strikes me, too, that when I come from that place of I want to help, I'm front-loading my thinking with a lot yeah. of pressure and a standard for knowing what to do. But if I come from a place of wanting to share or point to something that I know is already living in that other person, then it's, I don't, there's no mistake for me to make because it's not about me getting something right. Um, yeah. So I find when I hang out in that place um, of just being, just being whoever it is I'm meant to be in any moment, whether as a businesswoman, as a mum, as you know, a wife, whatever. There's a freedom. And there's a compassion. But there's a non-attachment, Molly, and that's what I love, is whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I have no need to control it. I have no need to sort it. I have no need to guide it. It will just unfold the way that it's meant to unfold. I had um, a client a couple of weeks ago. It was um, a commercial company came to me and they said um, they had a personal recommendation for me to work with them. And they weren't going to anybody else. And, you know, because I, I don't pitch for business either. Either you want to work with me or you don't. And that's fine. That's okay by me. And, um, and this was a, a piece of um, public affairs work that they wanted me to do. And I just thought, if they want to work with me, that's fine. And if they don't, that's okay too. And they asked me what my daily rate was and I had no attachment to it whatsoever. And they came back and they said, well, we can do so many days with that budget. And I just said to them, well, I can't do the job you want me to do in those days. So they've gone back to their company to look at, you know, see if they can find the extra funding for the days that's required to do the job. Now, previously, I would have been worried about saying, oh, oh, you know, my daily rate's this, or, you know, the job costs this, and, oh, well, they've come back and said they've got this budget. I'll just take that. It just doesn't make sense to me anymore. To compromise, knowing that I know what it takes to do something. Mm -hmm. Even though it's all unknown, there just seems to be this certainty that that's what it's going to take. And that's what I find really weird, actually. It's uh -huh. like, you know, well, no, I think it's going to take this amount of time. Based on what? <laughs> but there's a certainty behind it that says that's right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had that? Oh, you, know, like some people, they, you know, like, yeah, it's... it's, it's it's so cool. It is very cool. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's, 
it's like being held up. It's, I would say floating, except that it's more fun than floating because you get to play along, you, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty marvelous. It's pretty marvelous. Uh, so what was your experience of coming into the amount of confidence you have in this living, it's embracing the unknown. How did that unfold for you? This, um, I've, I grew up in the middle of two brothers. Mm -hmm. So I've always been competitive. I've always been a bit bullshy. And my brothers would say bossy, but I just think I had better ideas than they did. So I've always acted confidently but had a hell of a lot of thinking going on in the background. An awful lot of thinking going on in the background. When I came across this understanding, and this is why I think the word unfolding is so beautiful, Molly, because everything doesn't fall away all at once. You'll perhaps get an insight into one thing and then an insight into something else. And then a deeper insight into the first thing, and then a deeper insight into the you know the, the next thing. I started to see how I used the role of thought to scare the crap out of myself. Mm -hmm. And when I started to see that, a lot of my thinking just started to disappear. It just on its own, it just started to dissipate. I then realised how much of my life I had lived in fear. And that blew me away because I had always thought of myself as this confident. Okay, Wendy, somehow you started screen sharing and I need you to stop. <laughs> I had always thought of myself as this incredibly sort of... Um, confident woman who was completely in charge. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <Jackie. laughs> I've never had this happen before. This is so cute. Uh-huh. Let's see. So, Wendy, you're sharing your screen. And there's a little uh, box in the middle of it. There we go. Thank there you. There we go. <laughs> Randy, thank you for that new experience. That was wonderful. I recognize a fellow soul because I am the queen of, I wonder what this button does. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Absolutely perfect. And Phyllis has just written living in the unknown. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. So from, from the confidence perspective, Molly, it's like it was um, a kind of a forced confidence I had before without knowing it. Then all of a sudden, starting to see the role of thought and the role of consciousness in that, I started to see how much of my life I'd lived from a fearful place, mm. even though I didn't think that I was scared. And it was amazing to see thoughts that I had about approval, about judgment, about getting it right, um, about not being wrong, all of these things. And I was on a, a webinar with Dick and Bettinger one, one evening as part of my One Thought um, Professional Institute training. And I cried from the start of the webinar to the end. And I'm talking about sobbing, Molly. I haven't a clue what Dick and said. I really don't have a clue. And my husband came in at the end of it and he just said to me, oh, it was one of those webinars, was it? <laughs> it was just, I was a wreck. And that's what I love is that you can hear somebody say something, but it touches you so deeply. You can't remember what they said or the context in which they said it, but you're so ready to see something more deeply. Mm -hmm. And that for me is when I listen or when I read, I'm reading and listening from that unknown place as well. I have nothing on it because whatever is going to drop in is going to drop in. Yeah. I love I that. Own. So many of the insights I've seen, I've had, are 
I either can't remember them, if mm -hmm. they had a verbal component to begin with, I can't remember them, or they never really had a verbal component. All I just see is that my life continues to change. And it occurs to me that that's another dimension of living in the unknown is allowing ourselves to be instructed and supported and guided by this, for lack of a better term, invisible hand and, and respecting that and not second guessing it by looking for a bigger insight or the insight, I want the one that you had, I want Jackie's insight. And it's like, no, just can I settle and allow myself to be held up by what I am already seeing and know that more will come. Yeah, that, that's it, Molly. That's where I've had my deepest insights. Um, and I was speaking to, to a client the other day there, and it is, for me, that's the difference between a psychological insight and a spiritual insight. Mm. It's psychological. Something makes sense, and I can, you know, I can hear it, and I can see it, and it's tangible. A spiritual insight, I haven't a clue it's happened. Yeah. I really don't know. And I, I tell a story about... Um, I had a morbid phobia of bees and wasps for over 40 years. My brothers used to put them in jars and then shake the jars and then open the jars up and, <laughs> in front of me, bless them. <laughs> and so the angry sound of the bees and the wasps really, you know, people would be cutting their grass and I would be ducking, thinking there was a bee or a wasp coming to get me. And one day about a couple of years after coming across this understanding, I was in my office in here and a bee came in the window and I just turned around and it was a great big bumblebee. Um, and something inside me told me the bee was tired. The next thing I knew, Molly, I was Googling, what do you feed a bee that's tired? <laughs> I went and got what it was, it was like sugary water. And, and I put it right beside the bee. Now, the woman who has the morbid fear of bees and wasps, who would run halfway down the road, throw a handbag away, not sit in the garden to have the barbecue or to eat, was now literally half an inch away from a bumblebee, feeding it. Feeding it. Feeding a bumblebee. The bee eventually got enough energy and flew out the window. I had had neuro-linguistic programming, um, all sorts of phobia therapies and hypnotherapy to get rid of that phobia. But it just disappeared, Molly. Wow. I'm actually, I'm actually now I can walk along the road and I'm thinking if I see a bee, I want to put my hand out to let the bee come onto my hand. Oh. My daughter actually said it was really funny. We were in the car the other day there and there was a fly in the car. I said, open the window to let the fly out. She went, oh, mum, you don't like killing things anymore. <laughs> Oh my God, was I that bad before? <laughs> That's great. That's great. But, but it is this whole thing about how, how in the unknown, spiritually so much can change and we're just not, we're on the back of the lorry on a rocking horse, Molly. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to invite folks, um, and I, I'm sorry, guys, I didn't really mean to leave it until this late, but invite you to comment or share or ask a question. Um, go for it, Ian, and you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you. Where is you? Where are you? You are unmuted, my friend. Yes. Thank you. You are so beautiful, ladies. Thank you. I must say, I love you. <laughs> I'll take that. Yes. And I want to uh, put up a question to you about living in the unknown and um, as so Jackie so brilliantly described it just seconds ago about the bumblebee and uh, it was a transformation not from learning but from knowing yeah and i'm i heard rob told 
just a couple of weeks ago on the Supermind webinar talking about it's not about the learning curve any longer. When you uh, got the, just a little bit of a hunch of what the principles are and how we are living in them and we are them, uh, that's not learning, it's knowing. It's waking up to what we already know. Can you talk about that? Jackie? What specifically about that do you want me to talk to, Yvonne? <laughs> Just open your mouth and we'll listen what's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, for me, it's, it's, the, it's the miracle of planting a tomato seed plant and a tomato plant grows. It's the conception of a child and a child being born, that child then knows how to, to be breastfed. It, it knows how to call for attention from its mother or father. When the time is right, it knows how to start walking. It's within all of us, that quiet wisdom that guides us to do what it is we're meant to do, when we're meant to do it. Like you don't get a three-month-old baby saying, I'm going to try walking now, because there's no way on this earth that it would be able to do it. Yet somewhere along that transition line of, you know, anything from nine months onwards, something stirs inside that child that says it's maybe time to do this. And they start to do it. I found that as, as my mind's got quieter, Ivan, I can hear more clearly what it is I'm meant to do when I'm meant to do it. And more often than not, I find I'm doing it before I realise what it is the wisdom's told me to do. Have you ever found that? You're taking inspired action. For me, that's wisdom. It's I'm doing it. It's like, whoa, I'm doing it. I, I was in the kitchen um, about seven months ago and I was cleaning the kitchen floor and I was meant to be working from home and I thought, oh, I'll make a jello for, for the family. So I, I made this jello for the family. And next thing I found myself upstairs on my computer writing to the health committee of the Scottish Parliament saying, I want to meet you. This is why I want to meet you to talk about this understanding. A couple of lines, boom, and just sent it away to them. And all of a sudden that afternoon, I had four or five appointments to see people. So the amount of thinking that went into making the jello went into creating the email to the politicians. For me, that's inspired action. It's just, you just, you just do it. And you're not even aware that you're doing it. And, and that you're told about a kid knowing how to breastfeed, knowing when it's time to walk. And if we turn that around, we as parents know innately how to be a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, we know how to interpret the noise that little baby is doing. We know instinctively what they are trying to tell us. Absolutely. Yeah, oh. we know. All living things, Ivan, even the bumblebee, that bee's tired. You know, and, and a couple of weeks ago, another bee came into the room and my, one of my other daughters was upset the bee was in the room and I just turned around to her and said, it's having a rest. I, I don't know whether it's having a rest. <laughs> <laughs> just, the bee's having a rest. You know, and, and then it flew out the window. I'm yeah. becoming Dr. Doolittle. <laughs> what stood out for me yeah. in your answer, Jackie, is when your mind is quiet yeah and and that 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 living in the unknown happens when when we allow ourselves to have a quiet enough mind and for me my my mind gets quieter the more the more i live in the unknown and have experiences 
like the bee. Mm -hmm. uh, the more I have, the more I trust experiences like realizing that writing a business plan was making me sick. The yeah. quieter my mind gets, the more insights I have. And sometimes they're coming hot and heavy in the midst of making jello. And sometimes weeks go by and it seems like there's nothing happening. Yeah. And that that's all fine. That second guessing or looking for, you know, trying to find the answers is exactly what keeps us from having that innate knowing that you're pointing to. Yeah. I love what you said there, Molly, you know, that it's, it's not, maybe for some people it is constant, you know, constant insights about things, but there are periods where I can be not in my best state of mind, but I'm okay with it mm -hmm. because I know that I'm going to see something. I know that there's this almost like this divine discomfort that I'm not comfortable with what's going on. I can't pinpoint it, but I know in the playground of the unknown, I'm going to learn something. Yeah. I'm going to learn something about me. I'm going to learn something about someone else, or I'm going to learn about life. Or I'm just going to have a deeper understanding of how this all works. Right. I, so I, it's okay to let that go. A few weeks ago, I, I was feeling really uncomfortable. This was even before my surgery. And it just came to me to lie down on the living room floor. And I don't know what happened. This is one of those contentless insight moments. I, I can't report to you what happened. But my story about it is that on some level, by just lying down and writing out the experience, I was being instructed. Something was being shifted, unfolded, teaching me. I felt like my heart was opening. Yeah. And it wasn't a, an activity. I'm not saying that the secret to understanding is to go lie on your living room floor. I haven't done it since. <laughs> I may never do it again. But that each of us has these little inklings, these mm -hmm. notions, these impressions, and that you can play with those. Yeah. Uh, those, are, those are the unknown waking up in us. And we don't have to work hard in order for that to happen. It's the feeling that you can let go and that you can just live your life and that everything you need, maybe not everything you want, but everything you need will be supplied, Molly. Mm -hmm. That's more and more what I'm seeing and what I'm understanding and what I'm, I just have such a deep conviction for now that and you start to look at your life in the past and you can see the synchronicity. You can see where it's happened in the past, but you haven't recognized it. Yes. Yes. It's lovely to look back. Mm. It's lovely to look back. And I'm glad you pointed to that. Yeah. There was one other thing. Oh, you used a phrase earlier, the feeling of life that just mm -hmm. really struck me. And I'm, I wanted to bring that out before we close. Um, what I took from that is that whether the immediate experience seems to be painful or happy or sad or sweet or whatever, that there's a way in which if we can just be there with it, we can sense that feeling of life, which is in amazing miraculous thing and that there is, we're learning all the time we're evolving all the time but there is no test <laughs> you, know, you don't have to study for the exam about what you're learning it will teach you and it's in that feeling of life that you pointed to and I just really appreciate that image yeah. mm. Well, I, I know, want from, yeah, go ahead. What would you like to say so, before we close? It's okay, Molly. Um, Anne Kaufman has her hand up. I don't know whether oh, she wants to ask something. Sure, Anne, let me find your mic and make sure that you are unmuted. Hey, Anne. 
Yes, I just wanted to share that I've been, I'm the one whose house burned down the end of March and I lost just about everything. And at 74 to start over has been an experience. And when I look for the meaning in it, it's uh, not near as much as like as I, the one thing I wanted before that, because I pretty much had everything, was a hammock. I got that from my son for my birthday. And my time on the hammock is the most precious time in the whole world when I, I can go out there and then life starts to open up and I move into gratitude in new spaces. So little things can be so big. Mm. And that's beautiful because you just pointed to the, the whole the whole thing for me about this understanding of life is simplicity and how we make things complicated. And often, you know, and by the way, you do not look your age at all. You're wonderful. Um, and as somebody pointed out to me, uh, there's a tremendous amount of ease in my life at my age without a work. That, and when I'm in a down mood, I can go lay on the hammock all day. Yeah. And I have to, uh, that's an ease. So I do have ease in my life. So in other ways, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. That's lovely. That's cool. You know, as, as Molly said, life's about, it's about being human, which means we get to experience the whole range of emotions. It's not about hiding from them. It's not about pushing them down. It's about allowing ourselves to feel life run through us. I, I, tell, I tell my girls, you know, if they're crying, I see that as strength, that they're able to touch something deeply within themselves and cry. Yeah, I used to be the happy skipping three-year-old and the part that's in despair feels unloved, unconnected. And so today on the hammock, I was bringing the two of them together and getting them to see that each one's special in their own way, but that nobody's special over another. We're just all special. That's lovely. That's very sweet. I, I believe that Charlie Brown in the Peanuts comic strip, they had a Oh, some character was asking what the secret of, of success in life was. And he says, the secret of success is having a convertible in a lake. Because if it's a nice day, you can go for a ride in your convertible. But if it's raining, you can say, well, let me fill up my lake. <laughs> um, well, I had, uh, about four and a half years ago, I had the rather questionable honor of being hit by a car. And it broke both my ankles. Uh, that said, if I'd been... He, he caught me in the outer right front corner of his car. Um, if I had been three to six inches closer to the center line of his car, he probably would have killed me instantly. Uh, and within about a week, uh, I observed three things, and I, in talking with other folks who've been through similar, similar things, it's that uh, life is short, um, and it's uh, best joys are very simple. And that the stuff we get really, really upset about, including this morning when I was drilling a hole to drain water from an air conditioner and I hit a free online instead. Whoops. I kind of popped off. Most of that stuff that we just get, oh, isn't worth it. You know? And so I'll find it useful when the one I am getting in those moments, like, hey, step back, wait a minute. You're still here. And you have a challenge. You're still here to face it. Uh, and, uh, I guess uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney kind of kind of wrote my favorite slogan. It's wonderful to be here. It's certainly a thrill. Oh yes. You know, I did a video on August third. That's uh, on uh, called "Nothing Is Expected." It's on my Facebook page and and my blog and YouTube and everywhere, anywhere. Uh, and someone wrote me and said. At the end of that video, you said you were grateful for your experience. Um, during it, I talked about uh, how going into my mastectomy surgery, I was really at peace and contented and grateful and felt good about the world. And I woke up in a tremendous amount of pain and it all went to hell. <laughs> and yet somehow I came through that. And, I, and at the end of the video, I said I was grateful. And he said, could you really be grateful for that? And I thought about it for a few days. And uh, this morning, I went back and watched the video. And I thought, what was I saying? And, you know, honestly asked myself, was I really grateful? 
And what I noticed is that during that video, I was connecting very deeply with my own heart and connecting very deeply with the people that I was talking to, whomever they may be. And in that state of mind, gratitude was a no-brainer. It was unavoidable. It, it's like life is, life is life. And it didn't make sense to me to be grateful for this part of life, but not grateful for that part of life. Because it's all, it's all what it is. And so I finally wrote him back and I said, yeah, in a, in a good state of mind, when I'm resting in the unknown, when I'm at peace, I'm grateful, period, across the board. In a low state of mind, not so much. I don't walk around 24-7 <laughs> in bliss. I'm not one of those people. No, me neither. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even the kind of person who likes people who walk around 24-7 in bliss, to be perfectly honest. I'm working on it. <laughs> but I love that when I'm connected, I do get to feel that. And even though I don't feel it 24-7, it's as real as can be when I do. And for me, that's one of the blessings of living in the unknown. What I've learned is you need the contrast in order to experience it. It would be like uh, Groundhog Day if you had it every single day. It would get old after a while. Yeah, there's probably some truth to that. Well, that, my life was pretty much before the fire. It was pretty much getting boring because it was that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any final questions for Jackie before we wrap up here? I've so appreciated people. Somewhere there's a way to you, for you to raise your hand or you can just um, unmute yourself at the bottom of your video image if you want to say something. On other ones, they've always told us to do this to raise our hand. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do that if you're on the video. A lot of people are just here on audio. So, uh, um, well, yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a story. Again, it's just one of these little things I find useful. Uh, and it concerns the parents had two kids. And, and one of them was just, I think he tended to be, rather happy innately and the other one you just couldn't please so one year at, at uh, Christmas time they, they did a little experiment and they gave the fussy kid every single thing that he wanted um, down to the last detail and it's still them oh that's not good and just you know the, no matter what still very unhappy the other one when he opened he only had one present and it was full of horse manure and he started jumping up and down. He said, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, you got me that pony I wanted. There's a pony around here somewhere. So when I find myself with things that aren't going so well, like punching a hole in the air conditioner, I try to remember, oh, there's a pony around here somewhere. And then he set out to find it. So that's, that's free advice. It either costs too much or you get what you pay for it. There it is. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Lovely. Well, Jackie, any closing words from you? I think the only the only thing you know, we've talked about it through throughout the webinar is one of the one of the kindest things we can do to ourselves is is to make time for our own insights and to be gentle with ourselves, and and that's all I would like to leave people with is is to to love yourself as much as you love others. Oh, Jackie, thank you for going there. What a perfect ending note. Lovely. Thank you, everyone, for showing up today. Thank you, especially those of you who showed up early and helped me troubleshoot my audio. And um, I'll get this um, slightly edited so our first 15 minutes of audio checking are edited out, trimmed off, and posted to the website. And Jackie, you are the best. I love you all so much. Bye-bye.